together. Father, we come today and thank you for uh, allowing us to come into this place and to worship together. We ask that you be with us today and you just help us today, Father. We ask that uh, you be glorified today. We ask that you be with this little one today, Father, that's sick and you touch her body and you just give her a healing today, Father. And we know that there are many more today, Father, in our church, Father, in our community that are sick and are suffering. And we just ask today that you touch them, that you be with them today, that you help them. Open us up today, Father, for what you have for us. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, 
Take me. 
just a little homesick. That's what this funny feeling is. I'm thinking about a place called home. That's where I really want to go. I'm ready now to go back home. Mom and Dad will come and take me home to the place where I belong. That's why I call it home. I'm just a little homesick. I'm older now, it's plain to see This world's been so blessed to me Not a lot that makes me want to stay I'm making plans to move someday My Savior is who I want to see my family's there to welcome me Just a few more miles to go Until I make it home I'm just a little homesick I'm just a little homesick That's what this funny feeling is I'm thinking about a place called home That's where I really want to go And I'm ready now to go back home My Savior comes and takes me home To the place where I belong that's why I call it home. I'm just a little homesick. I'm just a little homesick. That's what this funny feeling is. But I'm thinking about a place called home. That's where I really want. To go. I'm ready now to go back home. My Savior comes and takes me home to the place where I belong. That's why I call it home. I'm just a little homesick to the place where I belong. That's why I call it home. I'm just a little homesick. When I see the sun rise in the morning. sound of children play I know it's all part of God's amazing grace and I believe there's a place called heaven
There's a bell down here if it gets out of hand at any point in time. So uh, it's good to be with you this morning. Boy, it's good to see the springtime moving in, isn't it? I'm always thankful for that because of the new life that is represented in uh, the springtime. I'm thankful for your pastor and the pastor's family. Aren't you thankful for your pastor? Let's hear it for him. We love you, brother. Thankful for the faithfulness, the faithfulness and the fruitfulness of of uh, our pastors and especially for Pastor Buford. I recently heard a story about a speaker that was invited to come and, and be a guest presenter at a church like I am doing today and they gave him uh, 15 minutes to talk and at about the 45 minute mark the pastor threw a hymnal at him from the third row. <laughs> but instead of hitting the speaker he hit a little old lady on the front row. And as she slipped into unconsciousness, she said, throw another one at him, I can still hear him. <laughs> when I pastored uh, Decatur, Illinois, uh, before that I was in North Carolina for uh, all of my life, and suddenly I found myself in Illinois pastoring, and it was the first of the year that I started there. And one of the first things we began to do, we were already in the season of Lent, and uh, they would have Wednesday night meetings that they had dedicated to building crosses. And I thought that was very interesting. I'd never been part of a church that had done that. And so they would bring in scrap wood from various places and buy the, buy the trash can fulls and just sit them in the fellowship hall. And the kids and the adults alike would have devotions and then they would start building crosses. And what they were preparing for was Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter, they would carry those crosses. They would have a quick meal in the fellowship hall after the Sunday morning service. And they would do what was called a crosswalk where they would carry those crosses. Each person individually carried one. Uh, it could be as big or as small as you wanted to make it. They decorated them with Bible verses and wrote people's names on them that they had been praying for. And we would make a trek from Decatur First Church of the Nazarene to the center of town, which was over a six-mile journey. And so uh, it was quite the spectacle. Um, we would journey through the, the, the upper class neighborhoods. Uh, and you know that time of year, people's outside. And 
We would journey through the middle class neighborhoods and we would journey through the poor neighborhoods and uh, you didn't need words for the message that was on display and it was the cross works. The cross works for everybody. Anybody that will come to Jesus, the cross works. And there's another message and it's this, we all need the cross. Right? We all need the cross. Each person here needs the cross and everybody out there needs the cross. And if you don't know Jesus, you've got to come by way of the cross. And if you do know Jesus, he's asked you to take up your cross every day and follow him. Amen. My friends, that is the message of the gospel. If you have come to Jesus today, if you know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, you have come by way of the cross. Because the cross is God's way. God chose the cross to forgive us of our sins. Amen. He chose the cross to redeem humanity to himself. And, and again, we're called not just to come once to the cross, but every day to take up our cross. It's where power is found for Christian living. It's how we serve one another. Um, and so I want to say something to you today and if you don't remember anything else I say I pray that for years to come you'll remember this the cross works and nothing else does say that with me the cross works and nothing else does say it again the cross works and nothing else does if you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 1 Corinthians chapter 1 We'll begin reading in verse 17, and when you have found that, if you would stand with me as we read from the word of the Lord. The Apostle Paul is writing here to the church at Corinth, a church in Greece, a country, and a city much like we find in America today, a very depraved a lot of stuff going on around the church, um, a lot of degradation, if you will, a, a lot of um, sinful behavior, outright rebellion against God, and, and here's this church in the middle that Paul has planted and started, and here's what he says. Look at verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolishness the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God... The world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews demand signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Amen. His ways are higher than our ways. It's a stumbling block to the Jews. Sorry, I missed my spot there. It's wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might be able to boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Aren't you glad Jesus is all those things for us? So that as it is written, let no one who boasts boast in the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today and we thank you that it never returns void, uh, but that, Lord, it accomplishes that which it purposes to accomplish. And so, God, I pray today that you would hide me behind the very thing that I'm preaching about, the cross of Christ. 
I don't want to be seen or heard. I want Jesus to be lifted up today, God. Uh, I want you to inhabit the praises of your people, Lord, as, uh, as we give you all honor and glory for what you're doing and what you're going to do. It's in Christ's name I pray, and together we say, Amen. you may be seated. The cross is offensive to the world. You understand that? It's an offense to those who are perishing. It's folly. It's foolishness. Paul teaches that, 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 that when we add human wisdom to the message of the cross, that it does nothing but cause it to lose its power. But God didn't call me to explain why he used a cross. He just calls us to preach the cross, to come to the cross, to take up the cross. There is a divine mystery, I would argue, associated with the cross that can't be discerned with human wisdom. That can't be discerned with, as Paul said, human discernment. And because we don't fully understand why God selected this method, our natural inclination outside of Christ is to view the cross as a scandal, a made-up story. Who, who in the world would use any kind of... Well, I mean, who would believe such nonsense? It's offensive to those who are perishing. In other words, the crucifixion of Jesus, when I say offensive, it's irrational to them. It's absurd to them. It's a made-up story to them. It is not something that can be understood to them. And the, fur, the more depraved they become, the more absurd the cross becomes. Our pride blinds us to God's truth. Yet in all of humanity's achievements, and we've achieved a lot, right? Right? I mean, in all of our intellectualism, oh man, we've studied the, the, the cultures of the world. We have a spirit of knowledge. In all of our philosophies, we still haven't found a way to God that doesn't include the cross of Jesus Christ. Because there's not another way. There is no other way except through the cross. There's only one way to come to the cross, and that is by faith in Jesus and what He has accomplished on the cross. In Romans 10, Paul says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word, which is what you're hearing today. Now, uh, no one is going to ever enter heaven and stand in the presence of God and boast that they somehow arrive there by some other means. You understand that. We will only get to heaven by way of the cross. Now, now the idea that the cross is offensive, it, it might sound strange to some of us in the church, especially if we've been raised in the church all of our life. I mean, that sounds strange. Well, the cross isn't offensive to me. Well, that's because we have, we've beautified the cross. You know, and good, good, I think we should as Christians. You know, we wear the cross around our neck as jewelry, right? I mean, we got gold crosses and, and it's on our rings and we adorn our, our homes with pictures of the cross. And I've got a beautiful, beautiful iron cross in, in the hallway leading into my living room that's, that's got a beautiful scripture verse in the middle. And it's a pretty thing, but uh, the, the bottom line is this. <laughs> the Bible doesn't describe the cross as a beautiful thing. In fact, to the culture in which it was written, I mean, we're, we're talking about an old rugged cross. We're talking about a bloody cross. We're talking about a place where the vilest of sinners went to, 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 for their lives to be taken for crimes they had committed. Think about it this way, an electric chair. I mean, I don't know, none of you has got an electric chair and any artwork in your home, do you? I mean, you don't have any gold-framed electric chairs hanging around your neck. Right? I mean, I mean, we just don't think of the electric chair as something that's beautiful, right? We do now with 2,000 years of, of Christian history after what Christ has accomplished. We as Christians see the cross as a beautiful thing. But this culture would have seen the cross as a despised thing. It was something that was despised. Yet, without the cross, there's no forgiveness. Without the cross, there's no salvation. And when we come right to the heart of Christianity, what I've learned over the years is I can preach a lot of things and make people really happy. We know that, don't we, preacher? 
But when you, get, when you really start preaching about the blood of Jesus being shed on a cross at Calvary, it causes people to squirm a little bit. And I've learned I can preach on just about anything else and people are okay. Well, that and maybe tithing. <laughs> the cross is where Jesus laid down his life. And the cross is where he asks us to lay down our lives. Amen? Close your eyes for a minute, will you? Can you see him there? I mean, we're in the Easter season. You know we're, we're headed for the cross, right? Excuse me. Can you see him there? Can you imagine Jesus hanging on that cross? Can you see the spikes in his hand? Can you see the spikes in his hands and his feet? Can you see the blood pouring off of the cross? Can you see his skin so broken that bones are poking through the skin? Can you see the four inch thorns piercing his brow? Can you see pools of blood forming at the foot of the cross where it drips from his body? Can you see him in all of that saying, forgive them, Father? Hmm. They don't know. Hmm. You can open your eyes. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? You know, it is, uh, it's entirely possible to belong to the church. It's entirely possible to belong to a religious institution, if you will, and still be lost. The message of the cross is this. We have all sinned and fell short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way. But thank God he laid upon Jesus on the cross the iniquity of us all. You see, the cross forces us to admit that we are sinners and that without Jesus there is no hope. How many of you realize that today? You're a sinner and outside of Christ there is no hope. You see, the Bible teaches in John 3, 19 that the light has come into the world but the people loved darkness because their deeds were evil. They rejected the light. You, you see, people don't naturally want to admit that they're a sinner. That's why it's such a humbling thing to kneel before the cross. That's what these altars represent, a place of, of, of humility, a place of laying down our life at the foot of the cross over and over. It's an ongoing thing. And people don't naturally want to admit that there's something wrong with them. We don't, what the cross does is it works like a flashlight. And it just sort of exposes all the deep, dark parts of our life that we don't like to talk about. I remember the day that the Lord used the cross to shine into my life for the very first time. November 19th, 1989 at 9.15 at night at 2701 Holloman Street, High Point, North Carolina, 27263. I'll never forget it. It made an impact on me. And that was when I laid all my sins down at the foot of the cross and prayed through and God came, came crashing into my life and changed everything about me. When we're confronted with the light of the cross, it penetrates our pride. It penetrates our bigotry. It penetrates our racism. It, it penetrates our lust. It penetrates our greed and our adultery and our lying and our cheating and our stealing and our swindling. And, and, and it's, it goes into those places that you don't allow anyone else to go. Not your spouse, not your best friend. The cross shines a light into that place and makes you deal with the things that you don't like to talk about. That's why the cross becomes a stumbling block. That's why I've seen people sit in services where the power of the Holy Spirit is moving upon them and they're literally holding on. 
because they just won't say yes because that means they got to come forward and pray and ask Jesus to forgive them of all that stuff that God's exposing in their heart. I've seen Christians who, who refuse to continue to take up their cross. And I don't know what that does with their standing with God. I think God's going to always do what's right. But I see a lot of Christians get eat up with pride. Man, gossip's killing the church in places. I see a lot of Christians at each other angry and mad. And then and, and the cross comes and, start, and the Holy Spirit comes and starts shining into those people's lives. And they won't deal with it. Take up your cross and follow me daily, Jesus says. Kill that flesh. Die to yourself. You know, the problem with living sacrifices is they have the tendency to crawl back off the altar, right? We've been called to live our life there. We've been called to live our life there. And, and so, so don't let the foolishness of, that the world has imposed upon you, don't let your pride, don't let who you think you are keep you from the cross, not the first time and not ever when God's calling you. Don't lose your soul because the cross insults you. Because guess what? The cross works and nothing else does. <laughs> nothing else does. Say that with me again, will you? The cross works and nothing else does. I want to also say to you today, not only is the cross offensive to the world, the cross is God's offer of redemption to the world. You know, God could have chosen redemption by any means that he thought uh, would work. But, but in his wisdom, he chose the cross uh, and the shed blood of his own son, Jesus Christ. I want you to think about that. God put on flesh in Christ and came to earth. People don't like to talk about blood in church. Well, and, you know, unless they're talking about their favorite TV show or that new violent movie that came out or they're, they're thinking about that story they just, or multiple stories they just watched on the news of all the mass shootings going on in our world or that new video game that they love to play where they get bonus points for finishing people off. Friends, we live in a violent culture. We are numb to violence. It, it amazes me how, how, man, people can engage all the violence in the world, but when you start talking about the violence inflicted upon Christ for them on the cross, it makes them squirm. It angers them. I've seen people get up and walk out of services when you're talking about the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for them. Doesn't faze us, does it? I have a pastor friend who years ago at Easter showed a clip from the film, The Passion of the Christ. How many of you have seen that movie? Yeah. I weep from the first scene. From the very first scene I weep because I'm so humbled by what Jesus did for us. And he, he showed a, a clip from that movie and, and, and as the nails went into Jesus' hand, he was preaching about the crucifixion and as the nails went into, and the resurrection, but as the nails went into Jesus' hand, uh, a, a lady in the church grabbed her husband and got up and was angry with the pastor and stormed out grumbling and said to another board member as she left, I can't believe he would show a rated R movie in the sanctuary. And later she told the pastor that the bloody images portrayed in the movie offended her. And she hates to be reminded of Jesus' death. Let me tell you something, friends. We better start loving to be reminded of Jesus' death. It is our salvation and our redemption. Every time we take communion, we're reminded of Jesus' death. We ought to be reminded continually. We ought to put something on our mirror to remind us of Jesus' death. You see, why does that offend her? Because she's okay with a decorated cross hanging on the wall, but she's not okay with what really happened. What really happened is an offense and a stumbling, so much of a stumbling block that it caused her to get up out of her pew on Easter Sunday and storm out of the church angry. It's a stumbling block to those who don't get it. I've got news for that poor sister. I don't even know her. 
But all, no matter how graphic that movie is, the real deal was a lot worse. There's no way we could depict what really happened. It's not possible. And so what we need to do is we need to learn to see the reality of what happened on the cross as the wisdom of God on display for the world to see. Amen? It's God's wisdom at work for the world to see. We should look upon the cross with gratitude. When we look upon it, we should always be willing to drop down and say, Oh God, I praise you for what you've done. You've paid a price that I could never pay. I glorify you, Lord. I give you all the honor and all the glory for what you've done. The scripture puts us in a tough spot when it comes to the cross. And I think rightfully so. Rightfully so, but because it offends people. And, 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 you know, I don't know all of you here today. I have no idea how you're processing what I'm saying to you. But the Holy Spirit does. I don't think you can argue with anything I'm saying. It, I mean, it's throughout God's Word. To take the blood out of the Bible, you'd have to tear out, uh, uh, man, I don't know, 75% of it. I mean, you'd have to tear it out from the Old Testament sacrifice. Do you know how bloody the brazen altar was in the Old Testament? They didn't clean the blood off of it. I mean, w would you dare say that, I mean, you guys are you pretty much, we're pretty country folks around here, aren't we? Yeah. So, I mean, you guys understand what it is to work with animals and stuff, right? I mean, can you imagine on the Day of Atonement a family having to come one after another with a spotless lamb, a little innocent lamb? and give it to the high priest and stand there and watch on that brazen altar as the priest took and bled it out in front of the kids? I mean, I dare say if I stood a lamb up here today and cut its throat and bled it out, that would scar you for life, wouldn't it? You'd say, man, don't you ever have that preacher back here. He's crazy. That's what they did. On the Day of Atonement every year, thousands. And then they would burn it on the brazen altar until it was nothing but ashes and then they would scoop those ashes up because they didn't want any God instructed them to do this and they would carry can you imagine the priest in his fancy robe and man he's all uh, adorned and, and man he's, he's, he's standing in the gap for the people and dressed in white and let me tell you something by the end of the day he is saturated in blood that's what happened on the day of atonement kind of changes the way we view the cross a little bit, doesn't it? Jesus died once and for all. There's no more sacrifices needed, amen, so that we could come freely to the foot of the cross and receive forgiveness anytime we need it, amen, so we could come and walk with him and commune with him and know him and walk in intimacy with Jesus. And he wants to stick as close to us as a brother and the Holy Spirit wants to abide in us. And all of that is available because of what Christ accomplished on the cross. Praise his name. The Bible says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. It is the blood that makes atonement for your soul. It's the only way to obtain forgiveness. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins. There's no way around it. The cross works and nothing else does. Aren't you glad that God removes your sins from you? Amen. Aren't you glad that he, he sets them apart from you never to be remembered again? He cast them into a sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Amen. See, justification means, the Bible says in, in Romans 5 that we're justified by his blood and saved from the wrath of God. It was all poured out on Jesus. And justification means a whole lot more than just getting saved. You understand? It means more than your sins being forgiven. See, on the Day of Atonement, all atonement means to cover. All that happened there is there was a covering of your sins. They were still there. They were just covered up through the sacrifice. Now, reckon, um, justification means that God has wiped out the past. It's like He's the judge and He has said, Case dismissed. <laughs> Never to be remembered again. So the cross is offensive to the world. The cross is God's plan of redemption. And finally, if you're a Christian today, 
and you want to walk in victory with Jesus Christ, the cross will provide power for your life. You ought to visit it every day. You know, people spend their lives looking for fulfillment. I've seen them. I've seen believers go to therapists and, and doctors and counselors and, and psychiatrists and read every new book and go to every seminar and, and seek out all the world's wisdom and, and, you know, everything Oprah writes, you know, when this is all they need. Now, I'm not against going to doctors, and I thought, please don't hear that the wrong way. I think sometimes we need a doctor. We need help. We need counsel. We need somebody to walk with us. But my friend, when somebody just keeps searching all their life, the search at some point, God makes a way for it to end. And there's power available to us that gives us purpose for living found at the foot of of the cross and we come to the cross and our sins are forgiven and then Christ gives us a cross and he says if you'll die to yourself you'll live the most joyous fulfilled happy purposeful life that you ever thought that you you would have never thought how good it can be so you see it's not a it's not a matter of coming to the cross once or twice or a hundred times it's a matter of staying at the cross where we continually die to ourselves. Again, Jesus said, If anyone wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily. That's the word. Every single day. And follow me. Walk in my footsteps. Do the things that I do. That means, what does that mean? You say, well, what does that mean to follow him? What does it mean to bear a cross? Let me tell you what it means. It means that we're going to become burdened by the immorality of this world. It means that we're going to become burdened by the sin and depravity and bloodshed of this world. It means that we're going to refuse to allow Satan to lull us to sleep through the media. And when there's a shooting like what happened, what's happened week after week this year, we're going to be broken hearted for it. We're not going to be able to just turn, our, turn away and, and, and go do something else. It's going to break us down because we see the lives that God loves being a Affected. We're going to take a stand against bigotry. It means that we're going to reach into the poverty stricken areas of this world and be the hands and feet of Jesus because he's given us a cross to carry, to be like him. It means that we're going to stand for Jesus and his word regardless of what's going on in the world around us. Huh. Jesus said, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Make no mistake, bearing your cross means or will mean opposition. It will mean discomfort. The cross isn't easy. Jesus didn't say it'd be easy. But man, he said it'd be worth it, didn't he? He said it'd be worth it. And, so, so, and, and I'll tell you something else the cross means. The cross doesn't just mean forgiveness for you. It means forgiveness for others. It means forgiveness for people that you don't want to forgive. Yeah? It means forgiveness towards that person that's wronged you. It means forgiveness toward that family member that's wronged you. It means forgiveness towards that person that's abused you. It means forgiveness toward that parent that's abandoned you. It means forgiveness towards that child that's taken advantage of you. It means forgiveness extended to everybody. The world teaches there are many roads to heaven, but the Bible teaches there's only one. The Bible teaches there's only one. And it's through the shed blood of Jesus on the cross at Calvary. There's no alternative. Can somebody play the piano softly as we close? Um, my daughter, I have uh, two adopted daughters from China. We have two biological children and then a son and a daughter, and then we have two adopted daughters from China. And they are both special needs children. And our oldest daughter, Casey, 
She has a disease called beta thalassemia major. That means every six weeks she has to get a blood transfusion to live. So every six weeks, she's a St. Jude patient and from Louisville, the closest Saint to St. Jude clinics, one is in Peoria, Illinois, and the other is in Memphis, Tennessee. So every six weeks, we put her in the car and we drive for five hours to Peoria or six hours to Memphis. We stay overnight. She receives two units of blood and then we drive back home every six weeks for the rest of her life. Her blood doesn't produce hemoglobin, oxygen, which means her oxygen gets depleted. First week after the transfusion is great, a little less the second, a little less the third, until it's really depleted and she starts getting tired. Then she goes in and her energy rises. You know, fresh blood makes things <laughs> come alive, right? been people that's asked us, they've said, how do you do that? Man, you, you guys are so busy as it is. Why in the world would you decide to, to take on a kid that needed that kind of treatment? Because the Lord asked us to. She's my daughter. And I love her unconditionally. And when we're making that drive, people look at it as inconvenient. I'll tell you what, we make that drive with gratitude. God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to make the ultimate sacrifice. I told you after her transfusions, every time she comes to life. Why? Because there's life in the blood. Thanks be to God for the power, the ongoing power of the blood of Jesus. Now I want to remind you today as we close, you see it there. I preached to you about Jesus dying on the cross, but he didn't stay on the cross. He didn't stay on it. Once and for all, it is finished, which means it's now available to us for the power we need for living. Now, now here's the deal. Coming to the cross means you've got to repent of your sins. That's what it means. And repenting of your sins means that you are becoming aware and that you are changing your mind about your way. And you're saying, God, your way is better than my way. I see that. Help me. And you're saying, God, forgive me for this sin. Whatever that is. Forgive me for my adultery or my lust or my, my whatever, my cheating or my lying or, or whatever it is. And he said, I just lay my sins here at, at the foot of the cross and God, I ask you to, to wash me clean and he will right here. And then you're going to leave and you're going to be tempted, but now you're in a relationship with Jesus and he's going to help you. And then every time you need to come back to the cross in that relationship, the Bible says we come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find help in our time of need. Hmm. So it means you're willing to admit that you're a sinner. It means you're willing to receive by faith. Because it won't make sense to you, but the power of God is speaking to you right now. That's the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart. That's called conviction. That's a gift. And God will help it make sense to you. I'm convinced of this. People want to do better. They want to be good. They just can't because they're depraved. But Jesus will help us. Would you stand with me and bow your heads? And we're going to have a song. The altars are open. If you need to pray and ask Jesus into your life, if you need to recommit your life, we can do it right here. If you're already living for Jesus and you just want to bow as a public profession of gratitude for what he's done on the cross and just praise him for a few minutes, the altars are open. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you feel led, if God's pulling at your heart today for any reason, maybe you want to pray for somebody else. 
then come on and let's pray. Amen. Praise God. The cross works. Nothing else does. Amen. Some have come. Maybe some could come and gather and pray with these that have come. The altars are open. You can leave here today with a new commitment to Jesus. Doesn't matter what happened yesterday or last year or last uh, part of your life. Doesn't matter. All that matters is what God is saying to you right now. Right now. Amen. We thank you, God, for the power of the cross. We thank you for the power of the cross, Lord. Anybody else? If you're here, I'm going to pray with you here in a minute. I'm going to pray. I want you to pray with me. Everybody bow your head and close your eyes. Could you guys, for just a moment, let's, let's stop for just a moment. I want you to hear me. If God has spoke to your heart this morning, here's what you say. This is you and God time. You say, God, I admit and I confess my sins to you. Go ahead and do that. Say that to him. It's between you and him. Say it in your own way with your own words. Say it in your own way with your own words. Say, God, I confess my sins to you, and now start confessing whatever it is the Lord uh, is bringing to your attention. God, forgive me for my impatience. God, forgive me for my anger. Forgive me for my lust. Forgive me for my greed. Forgive me for my inconsider being inconsiderate toward others. Forgive me for, for the grudge I'm holding. Forgive me for the brokenness that's eating me up from the inside out. Forgive me, Lord. Now say to him, your way is better than my way, God. Show me your way. That's repentance. Say, say your way is better than my way, God. Tell him that. Tell him that. Thank you for saving me, Lord. Say, thank you for saving me, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did on the cross. Thank you for filling me, Lord, with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Now help me, God. I want to live my life for you. Help me. I rejoice in you today, God. I thank you for the power of the cross. Let's continue to play for a few minutes as people pray. If you prayed that prayer, you just got saved or either you rededicated your life and you come home. If you need to keep praying for a minute, go ahead. I want to say something to you. I want to say something to you as we leave, and I believe it's imperative that, that you hear me. We need revival in this land. A real, authentic, earth-shattering revival. A historic moving of God, that's what we need.